Okay, so so our speaker is back. So the so the talk today is going to be by so by um by um is going to be by Akil Aurora. Um, so he is a so PhD student. So who's working in who who's who's working in the Data Science Lab in EPFL. Um, so um, so thanks for joining us. Um, so from so Switzerland, are you in Switzerland right now? Oh, great. Yep. So, um, so <laughs> thanks for coming all the way from Switzerland. So at night, um, so, so Akil's been working kind of broadly in so data analysis having to do with kind of um, so so structure and large graphs, um, and and has has and so has published a number of papers and including winning the most reproducible paper, so in Sigma, so 2018, which is, which, which is, which is a pretty nice honor. Um, and, and so before as a PhD student also worked in, so various, so research labs for, for about five years as well. So has a kind of a bunch of kind of experience from, from industry also. Um, so great. So so he's going to be talking about so low rank subspaces for unsupervised unsup entity linking, and so and so I'll give the floor to him. So thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff, for the very warm introduction, and uh, Vivek and Jeff both for the invite. Really glad to talk about this work. In fact, this would be my second talk about this work, and it's yet to be published. So yeah. <laughs> quite happy about it. Okay, so before we begin, I, I just have a very humble request. Let's try to keep this interactive, although we're not in the same room. Uh, it would, I would appreciate if you can ask questions along the way. And also, I sometimes might ask very, very trivial questions. And okay, it would be good if you can either type in your response in the chat or hell, even unmute yourself and speak up. I, I don't mind. Okay, and uh, I also have a disclaimer. I'm not an NLP expert, as you might have understood from the introduction. Uh, but yeah, like like Vivek or many of you in the in the audience. Um, so this is kind of my first work uh, on entity linking. But the the point here is that uh, I'm working mostly into understanding how users navigate information networks with Wikipedia as a use case, and also how can we improve the navigability of networks? So if you look at entity linking in some way, it is like in the navigability of networks or websites is kind of a byproduct. If you have better uh, linked text in, in, in websites, you can indeed improve the navigability of these networks because people usually organically click on links to navigate websites rather than searching uh, on a new page. So of course it helps to have better links. So this is the this is the angle, and this is why my interest in this area. Uh, and yes, the last point is that is this approach is not very NLP-ish, and also there is no deep learning involved here. So folks, sorry to disappoint you, but yeah, we will talk look about some very cute and simple ideas that work well for this uh, very nascent area of unsupervised entity linking. Okay, so. Moving further, I would say let's first have a bird's eye view of what is indeed entity linking, right? And a bookish definition of an entity linking is somewhat like it's it's a task of grounding mentions. And what are these mentions? These are spans of text. And in in the example that we see right now, the the span of text being Michael Jordan and science, which we want to link, and which we want to link to a referent knowledge base or a knowledge graph, and the, the goal here is indeed to properly disambiguate uh, these mentions to right entities. Okay, so let's let's try to understand what do I mean by all this. So, okay, who who are we talking about here? Like, who is the Michael Jordan uh, in this piece of text? Can you can you guys infer? Um. Um. So Michael I Jordan. Yes, definitely. So it's not this nice looking man, but it is this nice looking man uh, who works, who is like known a lot in the field of machine learning, kind of, you can say one of the founding fathers as well. You can, you can attribute him to that. 
but yes so given the context one can a human and also the background knowledge that all of us have in the audience like as in we can infer that we are indeed talking about the statistician the machine learning uh, researcher the amazing michael jordan but if you think about uh, you know if you think about a, a naive reader who, is, who has nothing to do with the field of science they could have interpreted that okay indeed the the basketball player who has also excelled in in baseball has started to you know become academically inclined and is also excelling in yet another field right so the point is that with with the domain knowledge we were able to uh, you know kind of disambiguate easily who michael jordan is but we want to make machines do this automatically right so that's the goal of entity linking and if we go even a bit more in this dry run or the dry run in this example what we can see is that michael jordan indeed can refer to the basketball player the computer scientist racing driver or even someone named michael hakim jordan i don't know what he this person does but yeah this these are taken from wikipedia uh then even the 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 word science could link to natural science applied science there's an album called science life sciences and the journal science which is the science magazine uh, about which we are indeed talking about in this example right so the goal of entity linker is to correctly disambiguate the the uh entities to which this mentions are referring to and there are indeed two tasks here right one is to ident identify which spans of text which i am referring to as mentions in this talk so which spans of text are indeed should be should be grounded and once we have identified the mentions then the task becomes to disambiguate properly to whom should this these mentions refer to so the two tasks being named entity recognition popularly known as that and the other being named entity disambiguation so for the scope of this talk we would just talk about named entity disambiguation and we would assume that a uh, recognizer has already been run or we we have access to mentions which we want to disambiguate so there are tons of i would say applications and why people do entity linking is because uh, you know stand as i said a standard task in nlp is that it helps or it increases the understanding of free text and what i can say is that both humans or uh, like humans even understand better but yes the main important thing is to make machines understand uh, the text better and which is also referred to as the field of nlu um right so and and there are other interesting applications as i said like coming from a different domain i could relate to it that okay this it facilitates an improvement in the navigability of websites right such as wikipedia moving forward it also helps us construct our refine english bases in an automated manner and then there are a bunch of uh, you know classical nlp questions again which a lot of people a lot of you in the audience have worked on already like information extraction question answering and so on and so forth right so moving forward i would just give a very brief overview of how is even entity linking performed and we will discuss a simple pipeline of an entity linker so we begin by a document again this document is not supposed to be empty i was just being lazy to <laughs> short text right but yes so we begin by a document and there is a named entity recognizer that gives us a list of mentions in this document that needs to be linked and then we have a candidate generator which helps us generate Uh, a bunch of candidates corresponding to these mentions as we already saw in the in the uh, example uh, that we took in the first slide and here the gold colored candidates are indeed the true uh, true entities to which these mentions are referring to so finally we need a disambiguation module that uh, decides on the true entity right and the the disambiguation module let me let me say that once again that is not perfect right so the disambiguation module can can make errors and which is what we see in this in this thing that the mention m3 is not properly linked uh, and it's it's basically there is an error in linking the mention m3 but rest both uh, both the other ones are correct okay so 
and I, I would just want to give a one more, you know, in-depth uh, view of how is even entity linking performed, like going from this architecture diagram to a bit of details about each of these modules. So we have a candidate generator that, uh, and the classically in the literature, because people work with annotated data and they have access to Wikipedia, they have access to even annotated information within these domains. So they can build these dictionaries or lookup tables, alias tables, probability maps, whatever, like there are multiple ways of referring to them. And these are indeed lookup tables, which just give you uh, in information about whether this mention links to which all other uh, can, which are other entities which you have seen in your uh, corpus, right? And this indeed gives us a very high quality candidate generation because you can build these prior probabilities, which tells us, yes, okay, if we are talking about Michael Jordan, most likely we are referring to the basketball player because this is what we see in the data, right? And then there are other uh, Michael Jordans as well, right? Uh, so the point being that these these prior inf these priors can be easily inferred from information uh, from information sources like Wikipedia, uh, Clue Web, and there are many other corpuses from which you can build such things. And most a, a lot of literature, uh, like a lot of work in the literature, has actually worked into getting good quality alias tables so that they can do better candidate generation. And also, this is a very strong feature which people use in their uh, in their models. Then, yeah, again, there's a probability map which you can generate for the for the mentioned science as well. So the, the other part, as I said, was the named entity disambiguation or the NED module. And there are different features. So prior being the one, then we can think of the local or global context where this is something like we look at an entity and try to look the words that are, like trying to look at the words around this entity, which or basically in the neighbor of, neighborhood of which this entity is appearing. That is a local context, or you can even define some context globally in the document. And then I've also seen some works where they, people talk about coherence with uh, the disambiguated entities. So for instance, uh, what you can think of is there are some, some mentions for which there is no disambiguation that is needed in a document, which are like, unif which like always almost lead to a single target. So for such cases, what they do is they first perform a simple first level uh, analysis to identify the context. Uh, there's something very similar to a global context, but it is derived from entities instead of the text. And this basically tells us which types of entities are being linked from this document. And then it can be used as an, a, a context, a global entity context, which again can be used to disambiguate the remaining entities in the document. And really there is a huge amount of sorcery the way I call it because the, like this, this field is full of tricks and people do uh, a lot of things here to just boost the performance of the models. And then there are sophisticated models on labeled data, right? People have used extreme gradient boosting, deep neural networks and really sky is the limit here because yeah, yeah like, and, and this, this is kind of a, I would say this is almost close to a solved problem in the supervised setting because I found a paper uh, which was published in NACL 2018, where the, they have received, uh, they have achieved a precision at one of 95.9 .9 on this, one of the popular benchmark data sets. And this is almost like, okay, so now kind of the field ends and what, what should people do, right? And there is, there's a bunch of information about entity linking on this nice blog that I usually refer to, which is called NLP progress. Um, but yeah, like strangely and surprisingly, this paper was not mentioned on that blog. And this is something which I found on my own, which is like a very rare event. I would assume this is a very good blog, but yes, this is the case. So as I said, like we noticed that there is a 96% decision at one on the bench, on the most popular benchmark data set, right? So why are we even talking about entity linking? I can, yes, we can conclude the talk. Thanks Vivek for your invite. And yeah, we can all celebrate Friday, right? And for all the Seinfeld fans out there, but yeah. And yes, okay, we can even throw in some beers if you want. So I would say, okay, we're not done yet. Please, please bear with me. Uh, and yes, I have 20 more slides. So please bear with me. Okay, so moving forward, there are a bunch of unaddressed research questions which we identified uh, whilst you know, doing a review of this area and what can we even do here, right? So I'll first start with the candidate generator or even 
the you know the these probability maps right are can we say that these dictionaries are naturally available across use cases i would say I, i'm afraid not right because there is an absence of annotated or label training data in a lot of domains which are where in i would say in fact entity linking is even more important so when we talk about specialized domains such as medicine law science or even these enterprise specific uh, knowledge bases or knowledge graphs let's let's talk about amazon for instance right as in they have this huge product knowledge graph and they have these huge queries that like a, a, a vast amount of queries that people uh, use or free text queries that people use to uh, query these knowledge graphs similarly uh, we can like i was at american express at one time and then we can even think of this financial domain right where the the uh, you know the whole uh, structure and type of language that is used to even talk about things is hugely different so we cannot build something from wikipedia or clue web and then take it uh, and then just simply translate it to these newer domains right so that's that's not possible and i i think i mentioned about these web based queries uh, so these are also uh, an important challenge where you know these queries evolve rapidly so you cannot maintain like it, maintaining these lookup tables are, is indeed a challenge in that case so we're not going to talk about these noisy setting but we're going to talk about this uh, the first setting about the absence of annotated or label training data right the the other thing because yeah i come from a you know data management background so the other important thing to think about is whenever you look to solve any web data mining or web data management problem you should think about can these methods like whatever you are proposing can can they scale uh, to web scale data right and i would say we can just hope right because you you look at the amount of i would say again say sorry not to demean any of you who does these kind of tricks but what i'm trying to say is that the amount of sorcery that goes into getting the best performance on this conel benchmark data set which i will again refer to it is kind of a broken data set and we see papers papers in emnlp acl nacl every year that talk about entity linking performance improved from 91 to 92 3 4 5 but yes what's what are we achieving from that and i would say i again i would quote one of my you know one of my favorite movies that okay hope is a good thing and maybe it's the best of things but yeah and so what i wanted to state here is these these baselines uh, or these these uh, these state of the art methods are very inefficient so for instance this state of the art method which we referred to it takes 9 hours to train using 16 cores on this benchmark data set that has just 18000 mentions how can we even think of making this scale to web scale data it, it's impossible and there are other deep learning methods which take even more than a day so the 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 focus of this talk would now be trying to do scalable entity linking without access to annotated data right so this brings to us to the setting where we talk about unsupervised entity linking and we look into the absolute absence of annotated data what i mean by that is there is first of all there is no training set of mentions and the corresponding gold entities using which we can train the supervised models and then i would also hint what all other things we cannot do because there is no way we can use app, uh, annotated data then uh, so just to state that what all resources are accessible to us is we have a list of entity names or their even their aliases because these are freely available from uh, certain knowledge bases like wikidata and there is a reference knowledge base or a knowledge graph to which we have to link these entity names so uh i have a yeah. question so uh, unsupervised mean that the linking is not given but the mention is there in the document and the list of uh, all the possible uh, the relation would be there and also the reference kb is there but the linking is not given as a label is am i yes. am i correct yes okay but uh, you can even take it up a notch and say that even the mentions are not given so we assume here the mentions are given but you can even do some basic string matching to identify like yeah. whatever matches with the uh, entity name in the graph or the mm. knowledge base you can think of that as a mention of course if you do that the amount of cases for which you have to run a disambiguation will be a lot 
because mm. almost everything could be a mention or there will be a lot of mentions apart from stop words and you know some some other irrelevant uh, pieces of text and then your disambiguating mod the disambiguator would have a hard time disambiguating anything because there will be too much so I, i'll tell you how, also how this directly affects our approach so okay. this is something which i i want i would like maybe even conclude with this can we do named entity recognition without access to annotated data so that that's that's something which is a which is the only assumption that i have in this in this particular setting but yeah a really good point thanks thanks for clarifying okay so as i said if there is no annotated data what all we can't do right so what none of the modules that we saw in this nice pipeline of an entity linker can use annotated data so the candidate generation using dictionaries is not possible like you cannot do generate high quality candidates you have to look into some very trivial string based matching or even you know something which doesn't use annotated data to generate candidates then the features derived from these annotations like prior probabilities or even anything which is derived using annotations the local global context and things like that cannot be used we cannot learn aligned entity and mention embeddings which is very important there was a paper called wikipedia to wec which tries to which probably was the i would say the first work which tries to embed entities and text like the surrounding words and also mentions in the same space using which then one can actually get a better sense of the context where you have the entity embeddings and the con context embeddings which is kind of an uh, you know some sort of an average of the surrounding words uh, and use that as as a similarity as a feature and they showed it works quite well uh, on the supervised setting so you cannot even think of learning this because you don't have access to annotated data and then you cannot train supervised models so these these are a, a set of challenges so with which i i would say it's safe to conclude that it's very hard to adapt existing supervised methods to perform unsupervised entity linking and uh, yeah I, we thought of multiple ways of doing that but yeah uh, i don't think it's possible so with this uh, just quickly give a pipeline overview of what we are trying to do I have a nice cute name called eigen themes again borrowed from eigen faces i would say which is like a seminal paper in itself so we want to talk about eigen themes for unsupervised entity linking and what we are trying to do here so let's go through, through this diagram and try to understand what we are doing so we have a document with a bunch of mentions three mentions around here so what we do is we assume that we can learn entity embeddings for which we don't need annotated data right so using a knowledge graph we can easily learn entity embeddings which are actually node embeddings uh, you can use deep walk node to wec or any of these amazing node embedding methods to and to get uh, a semantic similarity between uh, or a semantic representation of different entities so you have these mentions we get all the candidates using a candidate generator and then we get uh, all the embeddings basically we represent each candidate entity with their, their with their entity embedding and with using this we construct what what is referred to as an eb here which is the document entity embedding matrix so which is so for a document we have such a matrix and then we what we do is we try to uh, learn a subspace and the really the idea of subspace here is if we can try to identify some key themes in in this semantic space which is uh which which we have constructed from the entities lying in the document so if you uh, and i'll i'll probably uh make it more clear as we as we move ahead uh so this is this is uh, that key module which we do a subspace learning and then what we thought of is that okay can we also use some very simplistic weighting measures something like if we can we have access to the knowledge graph right so can we use the popularity of the entity or in some way the proxy for that is the degree of of the node so can we use that as a weight to to improve the to to improve or refine the subspace learning right and then once once we have uh, all this incorporated what we can then do is for each mention uh, we look at all its candidates 
and their embeddings. And for each such candidate entity embedding, we use the subspace computer similarity with the subspace and the candidate entity, which is which possesses the highest amount of similarity with the subspace is the disambiguated or the predicted output using the technique. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll just take a brief pause here. So if, if anyone has any question on the framework, otherwise we'll just move forward. I have a question, uh, not like in the general framework, but what I think what you are trying to do is you are somehow trying to see how entities within a, a full document is connected to each other and they should satisfy like the connection. And the one, that's why you form a document kind of embedding matrix and then you have each entity and now you are trying to see which one fit well in this kind of, matrix. if I'm correct, that's the main idea behind it. Like, yeah. Okay. Cool. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, so if you if you go back to this example, right, this Michael Jordan and science example, right. So you will have many candidates, but the the machine learning researcher Michael Jordan, Michael I Jordan, and the science magazine, they, they would be embedded closer in the space when compared to all other uh, candidate entities. And when you kind of try to do, a, a, you know. I would give the idea here. So if you do a, a eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix that you have constructed from these uh, document embeddings, they like this is kind of a theme that is captured and these principal components would be kind of correlated to the main themes, right? So th yeah. this is this is the this is the idea. And yes, so since I have kind of I've, I've kind of betrayed that to everyone, so I would just uh, you know go to that slide. So the intuition is we want to capture the main theme or the main themes in a document. And if we go back to this uh, example, really what we want to say is that Michael Jordan and science should link to entities from the realm of science, right? And again, there's too much science, but yes, to, to, they should link to the more scientifically inclined uh, entities. And this is what we want to do, right? Uh, so formally, what we want to do is we want to perform a eigen decomposition on the covariance matrix that we have constructed from this document entity embedding matrix. And we really, so each column of this matrix would be a component that captures some latent uh, facet of the theme that we saw in the candidate entities. And we, we compute such top, like such K, top K eigenvectors, and then use them to perform this ambiguation, right? So, so the goal really here is that the learned subspace is composed of components that correlate well with the main theme of that is contained in the documents, right? And there is an assumption here, right? Uh, which is made by almost all entity linkers that, uh, so, okay, so this assumption is more, in, I would say more, um, kind of aligned with the way we set up our approach, but I'll also talk about what is the classical assumption. So the assumption here is that the gold entities should form a semantically dense subset of all candidate entities in a document, right? And the, the assumption uh, or, or the, the more traditional assumption is that the gold entities are topically correlated. So this is what everyone uses in entity linking. This is the assumption that when we're talking about a document, the, all the ent gold entities that link from a mention uh, should be topically correlated. Um, so this is kind of something similar if, we, if you translate it in this space. And visually, I just wanted to show, since we have like, you know, talked about a lot of this. So I wanted to show that if this assumption holds, what would happen is, and, and these, you know, these numbers actually correspond to these candidates that you see here, right? So, so what we can see here is that if this assumption holds, which is what would happen is the, the, the scientifically inclined entities, which is like this Michael Jordan computer scientist and the science journal would be, would form a dense uh, subspace. Or it would be actually densely clustered in, in, in one region of the embedding space. And they would be closer or in the proximity of the subspace, which is represented by the green plane that or a light green plane that we're seeing here. And since, as I said, that it's these, these gold entities are 
a semantically dense subset and they are much more closer or uh, in the semantic space when compared to all other entities so that's why the other entities which are marked in blue are farther from the subspace yeah so um so so i think i understand why the other entities in blue are not um so clustered by but by but by each other but i i don't quite understand what is this sort of subspace why is michael jordan the the basketball player not on some global subspace that you found that is you know is often going to be the most relevant items is that is that subspace so is is a subspace specific to the the whole document or is that the yes, the entire is, is the oh. subspace is so we have one subspace specific to each document and then it does this ambiguation for that document and then we have you know different subspaces so th otherwise this idea won't work right this is we are specifically talking yeah, about okay. yeah okay so yeah this is this is the idea and what i wanted to also mention that okay we we talked about the assumption that there these gold entities are topically correlated there can be multiple topics uh, and since we have multiple components each of them can capture a correlation or a relationship between these uh, entities it, with different i would say in a different there is a different latent facet that is captured by each of these components so there is a chance that uh, this can also handle multi topic uh, textual documents but since all the data sets that we have had access to or publicly available benchmark data sets mostly we saw that there are only one one topic that that is there so we couldn't validate this approach empirically uh, and also it's very hard to validate such things because there is the notion of topic itself is is quite i would say uh, ambiguous uh, and it's not easy to quantify uh, and just requires some manual or qualitative analysis okay uh, that being said we move to sorcery right <laughs> so how do we make it work so the idea is um, is is good it it is intuitive but yeah there are some very basic things so we we talked about uh, how can we uh, like we can perform an eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix again what we are trying to do is basically we want principal components right so we can even look at it as an at, from an svd angle so basically what what we get from an svd is a approximation of the original matrix and then we can use the components uh to to disambiguate right but so what's what the optimization under uh under svd and it's like i i think you know everyone knows about this here uh probably much more than me because yeah uh so what what we're trying to say here is that the the approximation is a like it's a rank key approximation to the original matrix and which minimizes the frobenius norm right so what would happen here is if the like it's it's sort of easy to see that the the norm of the embeddings would affect the learned subspace in some way right because if there is some embeddings whose norms are larger they would have a more uh, they would they can bias the learning of this subspace right and that's what we don't want and we actually kind of i would say spent around two or three weeks understanding why this idea was not working that well because when we were kind of in this still experimental phases and then this is this is why i wanted to state i stated in the paper as well and i think this is a very minor detail which people don't even state but i'm all for in for reproducibility and better understanding for the readers and that's why i want to state this that normalizing each entity embedding to a unit norm uh, is really important if you want this idea to work well okay so we move to sorcery part 2 which is as i mentioned earlier right can we uh, use external signals to enrich the subspaces so we we mentioned about these weights uh, entity degrees right so what we can do is we can actually incorporate weights and it's a very simple method instead of building a covariance matrix we build a weighted covariance matrix and we simply just scale each each uh, it's basically we we just scale each uh, entity embedding by its weight which is uh, which are multiple mechanisms to get a weight and we'll talk about it when we talk about experiments and the the idea again here is that the entity embeddings which have higher weights would act as anchor embeddings and they will be prioritized in the subspace learning step so yeah like this then this has the effect that okay we can use some very easily available external signals 
and then just boost the performance of the Islam migration method, and which I'll show empirically how, how well does it work. Okay, lastly, so similarity function. Uh, the requirement, again, I think it's, it's stating the obvious that we need, uh, we need to emit high values or high similarity for entities whose embeddings lie in the proximity of the subspace. And we, we thought of a very simple way of doing it that we project the embeddings of the candidate entities into the subspace. Or in other words, what we do is basically simply uh, compute the similarity of the entity embedding, which is a vector with each of the components and then aggregate it to, to get a similarity. And uh, yeah, so we can uh, either do that or do this. And then uh, there, there was an observation again, I, we, we don't have any specific uh, mathematical intuition behind it, but yes, if we rescale the projection with the strengths of the components, it, it helps uh, to improve the downstream performance. That's why I don't call it as a claim, but it's, it's just an observation that we make. Okay, so we have now uh, talked about the approach and I would just present some, uh, some empirical analysis. So we use the most popular uh, benchmark data set for entity linking, which is Cornell, uh, based on the Cornell 2003 shared task. And as you can imagine, such an old data set, that's why it's broken. But uh, yeah, people have just uh, done a lot on, on this data set. And the reference knowledge base is Wikidata. Uh, many reasons for this is like Wikidata is probably, I would say it's a superset of all the available knowledge bases. Uh, when we did our experiments, we, it was like, it had around 65 million entities. And now as we speak, I think I just checked uh, one or two weeks ago, it had 95 million entities, I think if I'm not wrong. So it's, it's a very popular project. It's an open source project and people really invest a lot of time into it. So yeah. That's why Wikidata. And uh, we also looked into some other uh, data sets from the entity linking literature. The, the first one, which I say benchmarks from the English Wikipedia and Clue Web Corpora were introduced to sort of reduce the bias that is present in the Cornell data set. Because there was a paper which said that, okay, um, the prior itself is so strong a feature in Cornell uh, the way the Cornell data set was constructed that you can even just get 80% performance by just using prior. So, so this, the authors of, uh, I think this, this paper was published in 2017. I perhaps, I, I don't have the details now, but yes, I can, I can share with people who are interested that they tried to reduce this bias in some way, but yes, it, it's, it's very hard to do that because as an alternate, uh, threat, we even got very excited about our method and wanted to apply it at Wikipedia scale. And then we found out that 90% of Wikipedia mentions don't need disambiguation. It's a fun fact, but like we, we parsed the uh, Wikipedia data set and like uh, basically they don't need disambiguation because there is just one uh, target entity that's, that's usually there with these mentions. So it's, it's such a clean data set. So yeah, and this is why it's probably the last work that I will do in, in entity linking. Again, a very nicely solved problem, or maybe it's not even a problem anymore, but yeah. So some basic statistics about the data is like we have uh, taken data sets from different domains. This Wikilinks random data set is are actually tables extracted from English Wikipedia. So, and this is indeed the largest data set with around 54,000 mentions, if I'm not wrong. And this data set has another interesting property. It has very less text, right? Because as you can infer tables, right, you cannot even define local or global context in this way, the way you can define for uh, free text data, right? And we have data sets at different scales and different domain types. So just wanted to make the evaluation more robust. Okay, so uh, quickly describing about the setup, we talked about embeddings a lot. So for word embeddings, wherever we use them, we use the pre-trained word to vec. For entity embeddings, we use DeepFox. We did try other recent embedding methods, which have been shown to have better performance on downstream tasks such as node classification and things like that. But we did not perceive a substantial difference in the outcome. And also the trends were very similar with different embeddings. So we, we stick with DeepFox, the simplest and probably the, the most elegant approach of them, of all of them. And uh, 
we also tried one more thing because we cannot learn aligned word and entity embeddings. So what we did is Wikidata has description of entities, a very small description. So it's not like you go to Wikipedia pages and look into the whole text because when you take an average of that, it can be really noisy. You probably do not get anything, but there, there are very crisp definitions of entities in Wikidata, which you can extract. So we used the average of word to vec uh, word embeddings of the description words to get another representation of the entity, right? So uh, this, these are the two ways. Then we tried multiple weighting schemes and we, we tried a very simple information retrieval method. We use reciprocal ranks to, to weight uh, the method. And uh, we tried ranking based on entity degrees, which we can extract from the knowledge graph. Uh, and this is related to popularity shown ag again a lot in the literature. And we also uh, talked about ranking based on textual coherence, again, which can be extracted based on the, the so since we have now found a way to embed entities in the same space as words, because we have used the word, word, word vector embeddings to generate entity embeddings, we can also compute a ranking based on textual coherence based on that signal. And metrics, again, is stating the obvious, we use precision at one and MRR, popular metrics to, to quantify the outcome. Okay, so the candidate generator that we use is very simple, but practical. And I call it practical because it has a high, uh, decently high Oracle recall. And uh, the it's as simple as we just look at all the, uh, like a mention and all the tokens in the mention should be found in the entity name and then it is a candidate entity. So yeah, like for this mention, Michael Jordan, we can have basketball player, the computer scientist, but not Michael Jackson is the answer, right? And we rank candidate entities using the degree uh, because usually a ranking is needed to, uh, because we don't work with all entities. You can kind of just prune after, after uh, you know, if you have a signal, you can just prune off some very uh, weird entities after like after a cutoff. Uh, we did also use the information about aliases, which is available again from Wikidata to boost recall. So if you look at this, this, uh, this plot, what you can observe is without the alias information, the recall kind of maxes out at around 77, 78%, but with uh, with aliases, we improve the recall to around 88%. So we, we see around uh, eight to 10% improvement with aliases in all data sets. And that's why we, we stick with using alias information. Okay, so next moving to hyperparameter tuning, something which every machine learning researcher likes and also does not like because there is a lot of them to tune. For our approach, it's a, it's a happy story, I would say, because we just have one. Uh, the the number of principal components of the subspace uh, used to used to learn the subspace, and uh, as you can see, is uh, we we did a variation where we vary the principal components, and almost after ten components, the there is a saturation, and we fix the components to ten for both. And as you are seeing that there are multiple like okay, I think this plot uh, reveals a result, one more result saying that the weighted Eigen themes is better than the unweighted, which I wanted to talk later on. But yes, this this is also something. Yes. So can I ask? So so with the principal components, it it so it looks like you're not getting um, the there's there's not shown any harm of going to too large a component. Um, so if you don't, what's the downside of not using the principal component part at all? Is it just going to be slower, or if I go to k equals one or two hundred, is the performance going to drop off again? Uh, I would say a very good question. Uh, my main concerns were around scalability. That's why I did not go beyond uh, thirty. But uh, yeah, I I don't have the empirical findings around this, but I can definitely run some experiments and once once I have something. Uh, so yeah. So, but it, it, I mean, a different aspect of scalability is, do you, does it cost extra to have to compute the principal components when you're doing the query? And so, so would it be faster just to skip that step? Um, so actually, yeah, the point being that since we learn a subspace for each document, 
and then the query is derived from the document. So we it's basically done at it's an online task, not an offline task the way we have set it up. Maybe it makes sense to you know pre compute the the subspaces for each document and then use it. Perhaps that's also a good idea and that can be done. But yeah, again, this is not the setup that we, we employed. But yeah, very, very good points. In fact, I'm curious to actually see more components and see what happens. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so good. Uh, then I would just quickly mention what has been done in the literature, right? And then we'll just see a comparison of how, how well we do. And there are just two methods that perform unsupervised entity linking. And again, this the first one is really not a method, which is basically a very simple idea that you just look at all entities whose names match exactly with the mentioned string. And perhaps this would work very well with Wikipedia, right? As I said, there are many entities, uh, there are many mentions which don't need any disambiguation. So 90% of the time, this approach will work just wow, right? So we, we do use this approach and we break the ties by uh, using entity degree. So if two, uh, two exactly similar entities with the same entity names uh, occur. We, we break the tie using entity degree. Then uh, there was an approach which uses distant supervision, which was published in ACL 2019. I would say they, they introduced this problem. Um, and the, the idea is very simple. What they do is they uh, look at the candidate entities of a mention and they kind of try to rank all of these candidate entities higher than the uh, you know a, a number of randomly sampled entities which is which is you know uh, i would say it's, it's a very simple and a very nicely thought idea and uh, this is how they do it and eventually they compute a compatibility score between candidates and its mentioned context and rank based on the similarity so this was published in ACL 2019. And yeah, so that's why, as you can see the, the most, this is a very recent baseline. So there's not a lot of work happened in this. So again, we have got enough complaints that your baselines are either simple or uh, too restricted. So we kind of now in the latest submission, we have proposed multiple baselines uh, that we could con that, that we could think of. So we begin with degree again, right? Because we were using degree at a lot of places. We're using it to rank candidates. We're using it as waiting scheme. Hell, why not? Why, why, do I, why don't we use degree as a baseline to and see how does it perform, right? And uh, yeah, it's very simple. So I'm not going to go into details and in interest of time. And similarly, we look into the local or global context, which is again, uh, based on the similarity that we can compute between candidate entities and a local and global context representation. Again, recall that we have a way to learn entity embeddings from words. So that's why we can compute the similarity because they're aligned in the same space. Then we have average and weighted average, which is uh, which basically constructs a representation of a document based on the, based on, so in, in our approach, we use, uh, we, we learn subspaces, but here we basically represent each document by the average of all the entity embeddings. So it's a vector with which we represent the, the our document. And then again, we perform a very similar approach. We compute a similarity of each candidate with the representation of the document and get the prediction. So this, this is an obvious uh, baseline to our method eigen themes. And this is, I would say, this has been proven in the literature by, you know, to, it's a hard to beat baseline for constructing sentence embeddings. I think um, some of you would know that work. This was by Sanjeev Arora. Again, not me, but yeah, very well-respected researcher in the field. Uh, great theoretician and also now uh, a great person in machine learning. And uh, yeah, also not related to him, but yes, just <laughs> trying to state. Okay, so we also extended the, the technique by uh, Fong Lei and Titov to uh, a weighted version of this Tau mill uh, ND approach that they have proposed. And what we simply do is we try to incorporate the weights from the degree information into their compatibility scoring function. And this is a very cute, simple extension, but uh, as I will show, it works well. And we, we kind of did that. Okay, so the, the, the table here is again, a lot of information. So what we show here is that let's look at the overall numbers first, right? 
So what we want to show here is the method Eigen beats uh, all the existing baselines and also the proposed methods, proposed baselines uh, considerably and also statistically significantly uh, based on both precision at one and MRR, which is a nice finding. And, uh, you know, again, we can discuss more about results later on. You can send me an email, but yeah, I would not waste the time. I just want to send the key message here. The other noticeable factor here is what you can see is this degree baseline, right? It beats all the methods apart and apart from the one uh, that we have proposed, right? You can see the strength of this degree baseline. It's like amazingly strong. And what's even more that if you look at this nice, <laughs> this, this area where the performance of degree on easy mentions is like is one and on hard it's zero. This is just the way uh, these sets were constructed. So the easy mentions corresponds to those. Remember, we were we are ranking candidates based on degree information, right? So when we rank candidate entities based on the degree, if the first entity is a gold entity, we call it as a easy mention. And if the first entity is not the true entity or the gold entity, we call it as a hard mention. So naturally, the precision at one of degree would be one for easy and uh, zero for hard. And uh, this again leads us to our other, uh, you know, interesting part of the analysis. Like we wanted to understand what's what's going on with this approach degree because it beats the state of the art considerably well, uh, and even all other methods. So let's let's dive deep into what's going on with degree, right? So we did a very, uh, you know, in interesting analysis, which is referred to as a mutilation analysis. I think people from NLP or language learning, uh, the field of language learning would be aware of this. It's like the closed test where you mutilate the text by introducing noise. Uh, basically, they, they introduce blanks and they, they try to, uh, they ask people to fill in the blanks, right? So uh, similar way, not exactly that, but in similar way, we, we thought that, okay, let's see how can we introduce noise or uh, ambiguity into the task, right? So what we did is we retained all the hard mentions and then we uh, we actually tried to subsample the easy mentions. So we varied the, num the fraction of easy mentions from zero to one. And then we tried to see if what happens with degree once, the ha once you only have hard mentions or basically how even the performance deteriorates and how does it compare to other methods. And as again, as you can see in this plot, the deterioration of degree is like, uh, I would say it's the most, uh, it's the most uh, fast uh, degradation in performance. So it's quickly plummets to zero, right? Or even, so basically what you can see is that at easy, the number of easy mentions, the fraction of easy mentions to be 0 0.4, even uh, like the, the state of the art is similar to degree or you, the more profound result is that average is slightly better than degree. So the, what we want to show here is that degree may be a good method, but again, as I said, these data sets are kind of broken, right? As in these data sets are very easy. And when and because of this reason, we wanted to go to Wikipedia, but even that is broken, right? Because 90% of the cases, you don't need this ambiguity. So really, I don't know which data set is challenging enough to talk about entity linking, right? But we, what the message that we want to give here is that if, if someone finds a realistic use case where there are uh, not so many easy cases to solve. Then the the you know the, the performance of degree is not that good, and it's like a, this uh, you know maybe such challenging setting for such methods, right? And and the same similar findings were shown also for the MRR. Uh, so yeah, so this this is uh, an analysis to understand how does each technique behave with the noise in the data. Okay. Moving forward, we will look into the weighting schemes, right? So first of all, as I said, we, we thought about three different weighting schemes. One, we can use local context, global context, and also the degree information to, to weight the subspace. So which one works well? And uh, so the, the plot here, what, what we're trying to show is the unweighted version of Eigen, which is kind of represented by a dashed horizontal uh, bar, uh, or horizontal line. It's talks about the performance that you can get without any weighting. And then the blue bars actually show the strength of the weighting scheme 
themselves. So if you don't do anything, if you just re-rank uh, re -rank the candidates based on the signal available from the waiting scheme, what's the performance of the waiting scheme on its own? And then the results are quite obvious, right? Because a stronger waiting scheme would have a stronger effect on the subspace. And, uh, but yeah, interestingly, what we saw is that the using local and global context as waiting schemes, the weighted version of our method was not considered, was not, or maybe it was at par with the unweighted version because yeah, there, there is not enough signal. But if when we use degree, we really get a, a huge boost in performance is like around four to five percent, and this is which we checked is statistically significant. Uh, moving forward, yes, as I said, weights are effective because weights help improve the the performance and analyzing more or more about it from a easy versus hard perspective what happens is that like one might think that since weights are used weights are kind of using the degree signal right and the degree is biased towards easy mentions so the first like the second bar is quite obvious that we should definitely see an improvement in easy mentions when we go from unweighted version to a weighted version but what was even I would say uh, what was kind of a, a happy coincidence was shows the strength of the technique, right? That the performance of the hard mentions was also slightly improved. So it's trying to, like what, what I'm trying to say here is that with even using a biased signal, the approach, like the subspaces were robust enough not to get biased towards one. So basically the point being that the men's, the performance on the hard mentions did not decrease, it remained similar, which, which is a very interesting uh, finding according to us that, uh, you know, you can use signals to improve and, but still without sacrificing on, on the uh, other mentions. Uh, okay, so we, we did some robustness analysis. We, we talked about these other data sets, right? The wiki clue web and wiki lengths. We use them in out of domain settings where None of the hyperparameters of the techniques, or even uh, so, so nothing was tuned again on on uh, on the validation set, and we simply used the parameters that we had from the Connell data. So what happened is that the one important point to show here is the gold bar, the tau mil nd approach, actually performs the worst in the outer domain scenario. And this uh, recall that this is the state of the art method, which was published in ACL 2019, right? So the point that we are trying to make here is that this method is not robust to, to uh, para hyperparameter validation. And this is quite evident because we analyzed in their code, they have around, I think 11 hyperparameters. And it's very hard to tune so many hyperparameters when you don't have supervised data sets. And also, uh, you know, we can't expect to have a huge uh, validation set to even perform this because you don't have annotated data, right? So it's very hard to think of having good quality and uh, validation sets for such scenarios. And yeah, the other message is that all other techniques remain consistent. And again, you can see the strength of the degree baseline here. It's like on in other in these data sets is even closer to the weighted version of eigen themes, which I would say is probably uh, you know you can look at it as one of the uh, you know maybe limitations of the approach, if you will. But yeah. Or maybe the strength of the degree, the way you want to look at it. The glass could be half full or half empty, depends on the kind of person you are. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, we also did some analysis on the impact of entity embeddings. And yes, uh, as I said, the word to work approach here talks about if you use entity description words, uh, like the words of found in the entity description and then do an average to get the entity embedding versus we use a graph embedding method uh, or organically learns uh, node embeddings. And yes, it's clear, it's, it's a very obvious finding that these embeddings should be better than the embeddings learned from text. Okay, now I know I can see the faces. Yes, there is, there is no more analysis, don't worry. So we, we move to a, you know, I would say a vendor full summary of results. And what we want to show here is that the, there, there are three pillars on which uh, you know you should base uh, the findings on, right? So efficacy or the quality, then robustness to parameter validation noise. We, we looked into multiple ways of uh, check, check, checking robustness and also scalability, right? At the end, again, being a data management researcher at heart, I cannot remove this uh, paradigm out. 
So what we see is, yes, uh, I think it's obvious, uh, again, since, okay, maybe since I made this diagram, I might be a bit biased. <laughs> it's, so Eigen Themes lies in the center. It's robust, it's efficacious, and it's also scalable. Uh, degree is efficacious and scalable, but not robust, as we saw from this mutilation analysis. Then the state of the art, Tau, Milendi, and also the weighted version that we introduced is good in terms of efficacy. It's a, it's, it performs reasonably well, but it's not scalable. It takes around 10 minutes per epoch, and they're trained for 20 epochs, their method. So it's around 200 uh, minutes for Cornell data set, which is the smallest one. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it's it's safe to call it not scalable. And we saw on these out of the main uh, data sets that it's not robust to uh, you know different domains of data sets and also uh, robust to hyperparameter validation. Then yeah, there is these methods, local context, global context, which we have conceived. Uh, they are quite scalable. Nothing needed here, but yes, their efficacy is poor, and also uh, I, I I wouldn't call them robust because yeah, it's, it's that like that. And one interesting finding here would be that this name match and average, again, uh, you know, these are quite underrepresented methods and also thought to be very simple. But yes, these are scalable and also robust because they, they work consistently well across all data sets. And they're also uh, quite simple to think of. So with this, I would just summarize what we talked about. We, and okay, so I'll be a bit, um, you know, bias towards my work and talk about a lot of advantages and then we'll see some disadvantages as well. Again, so be realistic. So there is a single hyperparameter. So it, it's very easy to tune on un unannotated data because we cannot expect to have a lot of valid, like a large validation set. It's lightweight and scalable. As I said, it takes less than two minutes for Cornell. And this is when we do it in an online manner, we are learning the subspace as we disambiguate. So if we do it in an offline manner, perhaps it's even faster. If we do that, and for uh, yeah, for, it's 50 times faster, as I said, approximately than the existing state of the art. It's language independent, since we are not using anything from textual uh, information. We can just perform entity linking as well in any uh, in like documents that appear in any languages, because we have uh, the we rely only on entity embeddings, which are language agnostic. Then it's fully unsupervised. It's explainable. And uh, yeah, we, we can ability, we have the ability to incorporate external signals as weights, and we can improve even supervised models, right? As in you guys were thinking, where is the supervised model? So, so we did some experiments to, uh, you know, to, to you know, see if we can improve it. So we use very simple features. And again, on supervised tasks, people have already achieved 96%. So our goal was not to show that we can beat 96%, but was to show that is, if we use the score that we get from Eigen themes, does it make sense to introduce it as a feature in the classifier, which is the nice F4 here. And again, I was being lazy, sorry for not specifying what F1 to F4 is, but F1, F2, and F3 is basically prior, local context, and global context, which is like the most trivial features that people use for supervised learning. And then F4 is the score that we get from Eigen themes. So if we use all these four features into and throw them into a classifier or a learning to rank framework, uh, then what we see is that the performance that we observed is is significantly better uh, without and when compared to not using this feature. So this is some hint at showing that this this uh, feature could be used as a method to improve supervised models. But again, I, I don't expect so this this improvements would decrease as we move to the larger numbers like 94 and 95. I don't expect to see a 1.5 times improvement there, but still uh, this is some some interesting analysis. Okay, lastly, I have been taught over my past six or eight years of research that, okay, instead of painting a rosy picture or in addition to painting a rosy picture, one should also acknowledge what's the limitations. And yes, I am I'm very happy to acknowledge that. So it's it's a early work. It just scratches the surface in entity link, uh, unsupervised entity linking. The candidate generation is very simplistic. We can think about ways of improving it the quality of entity embeddings can be improved if you have a way to train uh, you know graph convolutional networks on wiki data scale if someone has the resources or tricks to do that we can use that embeddings but yes not not in the near future then again since we don't 
like none of us have that amount of nlp experience uh, we 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 have not thought of some very nice tricks to boost performance which again people can pick up if if they have or even happy to discuss with you if you if you have some more suggestions and now the main thing that i realize is how to even perform any r without annotated data which we've mentioned uh, when we were even in the initial part of the talk that it's it's almost inconceivable right to think of having like this is a assumption that we say that we have mentions in the data set and we can do some string matching to you know get the different mentions but they they will be really noisy and if there is a lot of mentions in a document which could be noisy the subspaces will also be affected so this will have a direct impact on the technique and this is this is uh, some of the key limitations i would say of this work okay so now finally uh friday yeah and okay so vivek are you you know do you have plans to have some zoom beers but yes okay wait <laughs> i have 20 more slides <laughs> no no i'm just kidding so we can we can you know just conclude the talk and i can take questions and yeah even give you answers there's a qr code to to the you can download the slide with this you can contact me by via these channels so thank you very much thank you. yeah thank so you. thanks for the nice talk on on this you know um so you know, you know balancing the analysis with the scalability side is great um so so is it even from the audience have any have any questions i have a question but if nobody has i have already spoken a lot yeah so go ahead <laughs> okay so okay so can you go to the takeaway slide sure uh just a minute which one disadvantage or advantage advantage <laughs> Oh, okay good <laughs> there is a lot so i will definitely <laughs> speak about this so yeah. a few things like uh, so by scalability do you mean scalability in the prediction or scalability in the training time because if it's in the training time i don't think so that's much important compared to scalability in the prediction or online setting so which scalability are you talking about here i would say both, both uh, okay. it's in both uh, in in training time it's a lot but then again the comparison is not that fair because we don't have a training like we don't have a discrimination between the training and the online uh, and the evaluation phase in our setting right what jeff suggested if we do that we can even build subspaces in advance and then it would be a fair comparison uh, for the like we can split even this approach in, in a training and an evaluation phase and have that so to answer your question for like the training for this tau milandi method it takes around 200 minutes we take 2 minutes uh and it varies for data sets that's why i said 50 minute 50 times faster um but on inference time it's around 5 to 10 times faster still it is it's still faster okay uh, another question i have is you mentioned language independent agnostic i i agree with this and i feel like this problem uh, the idea is very good but the thing is like you are maybe not able to check it full utility until you have good data sets as you said like because uh, degree based things is doing good <coughs> and even like uh, local context context and even averaging is doing good kind of thing so in performance level how do you basically evaluate something which is uh, which is i'm not saying is your, uh, this your problem kind of thing it's a problem around all this so have you thought of doing something on like maybe a low resource uh, wikipedia graph uh, on different language or maybe a scientific uh, graph uh, where the degree is not that prominent kind of factor and there basically compare other methods and all to show that okay this make more sense here because these things are broken here so degree won't work this won't work so maybe that's why we need such kind of method which are more <coughs> kind of thing like the improvement might have come very strong in those cases maybe you didn't find a data or like what what was the issue behind it or have you thought of it or not kind of okay so yeah uh, the like okay when we started doing this work we were really excited about this uh, overall topic right and i would say i i'll be bluntly honest here that the focus changed like okay so we we kind of realigned uh, the direction of my phd research to to some other avenues where you have more i would say space of doing quality work right because this is as i said this is a very saturated space and the impact that you get 
by doing something more here is like you get fewer bangs for more bucks right so it's not even bang for the buck so that's that's the problem and again so you have to realign at times to do work where you can create more impact and this is the honest answer but and the other point is that yes there is no uh, data set that i could find where we can directly apply it maybe we can uh, think so the idea about doing it on low resource languages in wikipedia is good but the point being uh, there is a lot of other challenges that would come in because uh, a cross linguality would come in and the existing methods to even adapt them to such settings because you know you you know this you have published a lot uh, in nlp and you know this field much more better than me and maybe all others know it much better than me but what i'm trying to say is that the competition is so it's like people reject your papers for saying that you don't have a you don't have a lot of baselines and you you have very simplistic baselines when even things could not be conceived right it's not conceivable to and then they will just think of ways to give you like just reject the paper right this is what the trend has been over the past 5 6 years which is not good for research i'm just saying saying out that loud but the point being in such settings when you have these you know sub very nice setting you crawl the data you prepare it and then eventually you cannot even think of baselines which can be adapted to such settings then it basically kind of reduces your motivation to do such kind of thing mm, yeah. but the point being my my point is that okay if like okay so my point is i am very excited to explore what you suggested and maybe if you want to do it we can we can think of preparing a data set and maybe even trying this out and then see what happens because this will only uh, i would say advance the field of unsupervised entity linking because we will have people will get more data sets and even uh, a good baseline to compare against right so yeah i'm all up if you're interested and what about the explainability how is this you compare because people if use explainability and interpretive without any context i i i i'm not very positive about this because there is lots of meaning and what is explainable what is not so what do you mean by explainability in this context like how do you think this is explainable or what is a nice aspect which people can look at the result and say okay yeah, it makes sense and it, it doesn't make sense yeah so the the point being <laughs> is that you can have something like this right uh wait for it Oof. you can have something like this right as in you can actually <coughs> visualize the the outcome and you you know it's interpretable because you know what would happen right if you so there are multiple ways of looking at it first of all this topical coherence right among gold entities so what you're really doing is just trying to uh, project the 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 embeddings of true entities in a you know in in the main theme of like across a subspace that spans the main themes of a document right so in that way the model which is the subspace you can visualize it properly and then you can see how proximities can even be like you you know what what would happen right so okay. this is explainable and interpretable in that way and then you can also do some further analysis like because basically my point being is okay it was a uh, i'd be honest again it was an it was a nasty attack on deep learning based methods because they are not and this is like a, a very uh, you know intuitive and simple method which we can later analyze uh, yeah. so that's why the explainability so i uh, if i can get it right it's basically the explainability in the method because of the simplicity because you know you are projecting things so you can look at the projection that's why we selected this thing so that's why it's in some sense that explanation if you have a non linearity the thing we don't know like why it's working kind of thing in that sense exactly exactly okay. so we know here why where it would work and where it would not right if the mm. assumption doesn't hold it won't and it's okay. that's why it directly depends on the even the quality of the embeddings right so if the embeddings okay. are it's are, are crappy it won't work right because yeah so that's why you you need to have a good embedding and this okay. brings me to another aspect that if you don't have good knowledge graphs this technique won't work because yeah that the okay. embedding are actually dependent on the quality of the knowledge graphs right okay. so that's that's uh, again take it with a grain of salt yeah so <laughs> somehow it's basically if we can utilize the unlabeled data to get better embeddings and better things then we can use this approach but we need lots of unlabeled data also for doing this thing uh, because of the we need good embeddings in the beginning also somehow to start so this. but good embeddings are reliant on the knowledge base 
and not on yeah. the text. Uh-huh, knowledge. So you don't need textual information, right? But you need so you knowledge. need a high quality knowledge graph or a high quality knowledge base. Interesting. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, I think I have just so many questions. Now, nah, nice work. Thanks for a great talk. Yeah. So great. So, so I think we're running out of time. So, so, um, so let's thank the speaker again. And uh, so we'll see you all in so a couple weeks. So, so thanks again, Akil, for for coming. And so, um, so, so I'm taking so, some time away from your Friday beers. So in the in the evening there. So. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the time. And yeah, it was really an honor to give a talk at such a nice venue. Thank you. Great. I have a question. So, yeah, uh, somebody has a question. Uh, huh? Is 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 the next data seminar the last one we have to attend? For those of us taking this for credit. Uh, okay, so I I'm not sure. Yeah, actually, you uh, it's the last one. Actually, we have more talks because we never didn't plan for it, but people signed up. So, but yeah, <laughs> actually, officially it's the last one. But I I suggest like since we have all the talks, and if you are not doing anything more important, then definitely attend those talks also. Okay, but officially speaking, <laughs> is this the last one? I think the the end of semester is the last one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, then cool. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Yeah. Happy. Enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah. Nice stuff. Thank you.